Jean, we're just we're so pleased you're here. We are so pleased you're here, and uh, a little a little overwhelmed actually uh, to be in the company of so many obvious <laughs> leaders and people with vision and anointing, uh, being uh, used of the Lord in such a variety of ways. It's, it's a real joy, and thank you, Fawn, for arranging this under the hand of the Lord. It's it's so our joy to have you. Jean, I want to talk to you and ask you some of the signs and wonders you've seen the Lord do. I know this is a time when many of us are believing for more signs and wonders. And um, uh, I heard a story about you one time having a day off in Hong Kong and going off into, was it the New Territories? The Macau. Macau. Mm -hmm. And having, tell, tell us what happened there. Well, it was, you know, it was my day off. Um, and... Uh, I went over to Macau actually to visit an orphanage that I that Four Square the Four Square Church had there, and after looking through the orphanage and getting acquainted with the staff and talking with them, um, kind of a spontaneous plan developed, and they asked me if I would stay and speak in their chapel uh, to uh, anyone that would, could come in, so. I agreed, and because uh, I had the whole day, and uh, they must have, I don't know how, they must have really had a, um, a wonderful communication system for instant uh, uh, news, because uh, when I went into the chapel, it was packed, and uh, the, it was so full that we, we, there weren't even chairs. People were just standing in shoulder to shoulder. It was a long, narrow room. And um, the, the children were brought in, and they were sitting on the floor and all, all on the platform around me. So we really were. It was just kind of a packed situation. And I had an interpreter um, who was uh, Scottish and Chinese, a wonderful bombastic combination, you know. <laughs> and um, her name was Hannah, and she had interpreted for some very famous people like Billy Graham, mm -hmm. uh, and, but I don't think she had actually interpreted for someone with uh, operating in the gifts of the Spirit in, in praying for the sick. And um, so at the end of my message, which was a... Uh, well, the, the leader of the orphanage said to me, most of these people in here, in the in the main sanctuary part, aside from the children and the staff that were all around me, he said, have never heard the gospel. Uh, many of them have uh, come across, have, but the, at the risk of their lives, have swum across or sneaked in from communist China, that's when, of course, things were much tighter. And um, so he said, many of them, I shouldn't say most of them, but many of them have never heard the gospel before. So the message I brought was, I remember very clearly what my text was. It was um, where Mary asked the gardener, uh, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where to find him, uh, where they've laid him. And I was talk. I spoke on losing your God, because I realized in the awful tumult of communism and and the uh, struggle there in China that many people had lost their traditions and their traditional beliefs. So um, I talked about how that we can't find God on our own, but God finds us, and um, uh, and at the end of my message, I. Uh, had given, I was giving, going to give an appeal for salvation. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly and said, pray for the sick. And uh, I, I was a little kind of surprised because usually before I pray for the sick, I, I have a message of faith and speak on that subject somewhat. I had not touched on it. I hadn't included my testimony or anything. So... Uh, it, I, I just felt like these people weren't ready for that. <laughs> but how how we limit God, you know, and misjudge how God works. And, and we, we expect people to be sort of educated and conditioned for our messages by us. <laughs> and uh, often uh, God is doing it other ways. So anyway, I... Um, 
I hesitated for a moment, and then I whispered to my interpreter, and I said, the Lord has just spoken to me and told me to pray for the sick. And she said, what? <laughs> you know, and she was a little short fire plug of a woman, and she, <laughs> spark plug, and, and she, she said, what? And, and uh, I said, uh, I, pray, I pray for the sick. She said, you do? I don't believe in that. And so I, right away I felt this friction, you know. And uh, so I think we had a hymn going on to kind of fill in the time right th at that point. And, the, <laughs> and uh, then I, I said, in fact, the Lord is telling me to do something I have never done before. And um, she looked at me as if, now what, you know? And I said, he's telling me, because immediately my thought was, how can I do this because of the crowd and the, the crowded conditions? And the Lord spoke to me and said, move down off of the platform, a little tiny box of a thing I was standing on, and move amongst the people and ask them to touch you. And if they touch you, I will heal them. I've never done that before, <laughs> nor since, you know. And uh, so, of course, my interpreter was already upset with me. But when I told her this, it was off of the wall, you know. And she said, well, I won't do that. I won't, I won't even say that. And I said, but, uh, and suddenly an authority came on me, you know, and I said, you are here as my servant uh, and uh, my interpreter. And we are both servants of God. So you must obey what I feel God is telling me to do and she blinked and it I guess the Holy Spirit carried weight with it because she agreed you know I know I could have never convinced her because she was really a stubborn little Scots Chinese woman and um, so uh, reluctantly and hopefully she told them what I told her to say you know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he was on earth, he healed the sick. And that I myself had been miraculously healed. And I knew that Jesus could heal them too. And if they would um, allow me, I would like to come and walk amongst them the way Jesus would walk amongst them because he always moved amongst the crowds. And... Um, it, and since, uh, and, and if they would just reach out and touch me as I walked by, I would be in a continuous prayer for them, and Jesus would heal them. I wouldn't heal them, but I would be praying for them as they, um, uh, as I walked through. I was, uh, uh, you know, it was a difficult thing to explain. I mean, it, it would be difficult to explain to a Pentecostal <laughs> congregation, and. Um, so um, uh, maybe ignorance is bliss because they had never heard anything else, and I guess they figured this is the way it's always done, you know. <laughs> but in any case, I stepped down off the platform, and um, uh, suddenly it was like um, I remember the remarkable quietness that was on the uh, in the room. Um, you. It was no one was speaking. The children were quiet. It was just a heavy silence, um, an awesome sense of the presence of God. And um, I remember my prayers were my prayer was more in tears than in words. I just remember weeping copiously as I walked amongst them, and they reached out and over each other's shoulders and touched me. And, when I got to the back door or the front door of the chapel, uh, which faced this little street outside, you know how busy Asian streets are, always noisy. That quietness was even out there, and there were almost as many people standing outside listening as there were inside the chapel. It was full. Of, the street was full of people. So I moved out there as well, and then I came back in and when I got back up to the platform, um, I said to Hannah, uh, she had remained on the platform while I had, had did this maneuver, you know. And uh, uh, I said to her, now ask them, those that are healed, 
to just raise their hand and say what they were healed of. And uh, it, the quietness was just broken. Like a, it was like a Chinese convention. You know, they, they all began to speak at once. And they were waving their hands. And I remembered one man particularly who had a... Apparently he had broken his arm and the bone had not been set properly and it jutted against the skin and he had this crooked arm with this protruding obviously a bone just almost like it was going to pop out of the skin you know but very awkward and painful looking and he'd reached out with his good hand to touch me and and he was waving this arm that had been instantly healed and straightened and um, and then the other one I had remembered too was a mother who uh, couldn't reach me because she was holding a baby. And the baby's eyes were had pus on them, and, and the, there, was, uh, there was just a, like, matted, you know, c coated with this infection. And she reached her baby over the heads of those in front of her, and I touched the baby. And now she was waving the baby, <laughs> holding it up in the air and waving it back and forth. And he had these beautiful little eyes that looked like black buttons that were shining bright, you know. And uh, so they, as they were shouting, she, uh, Hannah got engaged in conversation with these people, and I could see the tears coursing down her cheeks because she forgot me and she was so excited about what she was hearing these people telling what God had done for them and um, I, I, I tapped her and I said Hannah what's happening you know tell me what's going on and um, oh she says it's wonderful it's just so wonderful she said uh, it's like the Bible <laughs> and um, so I said, well, what about that man? And then she told me that he, his arm had been broken and not set properly and it was healed. And I said, and the baby. And there were others. I can't remember them all right now, but particularly this baby. And uh, the awesome thing was that she said, and she was sobbing when she was telling me this. She said, this baby was born without eyes. And she said, uh, some kind of infection I, I, the little few little words she told me, I, I thought it might have been um, uh, a syphilis or something like that, you know. But she said, no, no, no eyes. And she said, God has made new eyes for this baby. And um, uh, we all were weeping, you know. Uh, the leader of the orphanage, I remember he dropped on his knees and, and many others did too because it was just such an awesome moment. And um, uh, they said that the, um, the baby's eyes were so bright. And, oh, and at that moment then, I remember seeing a little Chinese woman uh, in a uniform. I, I don't know what the uniform was, but it was very official looking. Uh, almost like a police uniform, and she walked up to the front, strutted up to the front, and uh, and with uh, a lot of anger, she said, uh, "I'm a doctor, and I know this child." And uh, she says, "I've known this baby from its birth. I want to see these this this child." And so she examined them him, and she said, "Well, this baby has this baby has the eyes of a newborn child." And I said, well, that's because God just made them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, um, and, and she accepted, she was a communist leader, and she accepted Jesus that day and was con and converted. Many others, the whole room of people were giving their hearts to the Lord. I, I never really gave a proper altar call, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was, I didn't have to do the hands raised and, you know, stand and so on. It was uh, all done for me uh, by that those notable miracles. It was a, it was a God's day, uh, not on the calendar, not in the appointment book, but it was certainly on in God's calendar. So it was a wonderful experience. Jean, there was another God's day when you were 
was it 15 or 16 and you went to pray alongside the side of your mother at her bed do you want yeah. to tell us a little bit about that oh um my my mother uh was a a god-fearing woman but um not a believer you know she hadn't been born again well i you know i i want to be careful because who knows the heart but i know that she was spiritually deprived let's put it that way um she had had a very genuine experience as a child but it was a one-off experience and um as she lived amongst people who didn't attend church and so she entered her adult life without a church connection at all uh, but always with the memory of that one encounter that she had had with the Lord uh, of repentance and accepting the Lord as her Savior. So who knows the heart, you know. Uh, but um, when, um, when, we, when, when uh, I became seriously ill and through her, or through the memory of that experience, she persevered in finding someone to pray for me because she realized that uh, I needed to have an encounter with God before I died. And fortunately, she found someone that not only could uh, lead me to the Lord for salvation, but who could pray for my healing. <laughs> Instead of praying for me to die uh, righteously, she prayed for me to live as was a leading minister. So as a consequence, my mother and father became Christians. And um, my mother was in restaurant business and worked very, very hard. And, um, uh, but she was in general good health. You know, it wasn't like she was a, a, an invalid type of woman or anything. She was robust enough to take care of her businesses. Um, but one morning, um, or one night rather, when I went into my bedroom after coming home from church, the Lord spoke to me and told me to come back uh, to go into my mother's room and pray with her before I retired. We usually prayed together as a family in the morning, but um, the Lord said, I want you to go in and pray with your mother tonight. So I went into her bedroom and, and she was on her knees by the bed. And I said, um, I just thought I'd come in and pray with you before I go to bed. Oh, she said, that's good, come over here, honey. So I knelt beside her and we were praying aloud together and uh, suddenly she got very quiet. So I thought, well, she must have some things she'd like to pray about on her own. And I got up to slip out of the room. And I looked back when I got to the door, and I noticed that she was kind of slumped over in a kind of an awkward position. And I realized something was wrong, so I hurried back over to her. And... Um, she was unconscious. I think maybe she was even dead at that point, but I couldn't accept that. And I called my dad, who was out in the kitchen raiding the refrigerator, um, and he came in, and we got her up onto the bed. And then uh, next door, we lived in a duplex, and next door we had a neighbor who had also just come to the Lord and also worked for my mother. And uh, but she was also a um, a registered nurse, so um, Marie came in and she examined my mother and she said, "Jean, she said, your mother is has slipped away to be with Jesus." And I remember I I couldn't you know the shock, and I couldn't accept it. And I remember going over into the corner of the bedroom, and just weeping and praying, "Lord, bring my mother back to me." In the meantime, my father had called the pastor, and um, he was on his way. And um, the doctor was on his, the doctor had been called as well as so the doctor was on his way. And as I was praying, um, my mother, uh, who, who seemed to all of us to be really, uh, had, had gone, um, she suddenly blinked, kind of blinked her eyes. And I remember Marie saying, uh, the, the waitress that was our neighbor, she said, oh, look, she said, her eyes just kind of fluttered. 
And then she turned her head ever so slowly, and she looked over at me in the corner of the room where I was still praying. And she said um, very slowly, why did you bring me back? And, uh, of course, I rushed over to the bed and my father as well. And, and, um, and the doctor arrived just then. And uh, let's see. No, I think the pastor got there first. But um, uh, it, the, when the doctor came in, I remember him getting us all out of the room, you know, <laughs> except my father. And uh, then he called us in and he said, you're... Uh, Mrs. Murphy is uh, very close to death. Well, we all knew that she had been there and back, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, I can't move her because she's, uh, it seems like a rupture in her heart. And so he said, um, I want her to be left very quiet and uh, she mustn't be disturbed. And he, and, and he said, I'm going to go to the hospital and I'll call back later. So uh, the, the, then that's when, yeah, that's when the pastor came. And um, it's been a little while since I've told this. <laughs> and uh, I remember Brother Allen coming over to me because I was just praying so, so hard. And he said, um, Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm fumbling on this a little bit. He actually came before the doctor because I remember he came over to me because I was screaming my prayer, Lord, bring my mother back to me. And uh, he, t he took a hold of me and he said, Jean, he said, I've got to tell you something. He said, this morning when your mother came to church, um, after the service, she asked to see me. And um, she told me that when she had been praying that morning, that the Lord had told her that he was going to take her home that day. And, and she wanted to make her funeral plans with me. And he said, I've never in all the years I've pastored had such a request. And he said, um, I said, oh, Mrs. Murphy, uh, Sister Murphy, we, called, we were called in those days. He said, uh, are you sure? He said, the... Uh, and she said, yes, she said, I have some definite plans I want to make. And um, um, I remember that I was kind of hanging around, and she had asked me to go sit, go in the car and wait with my father. <laughs> and so he said she actually made some plans and suggestions to me about you particularly. And uh, And then we planned to talk more in the evening. So the whole day, she had been kind of waiting and feeling like the Lord was going to take her home. And um, the afternoon went by. We went back to church that night. And she talked to my pastor, our pastor, a little bit more. And then came home. And that was when then the Lord spoke to me to go in and pray with her. And uh, he did take her home. Well, uh, of course, my mother was very weak. And um, I remember the doctor calling back because he wanted to make some arrangements about moving my mother if she was got a, a little better. And uh, my father said, uh, he said, how is Mrs. Murphy? And he said, well, she, she's awake, uh, she's resting, and uh, she doesn't seem to be in any distress. And finally, she, he told the doctor, he said, look, I think she's getting more rest than any of us. He said, I'll call you if I see any, any changes in her. And she rested all through the night. And finally, when the doctor came back in the morning, he said, well, it's remarkable. You know, she's much better. And, um, but she was very, very weak and very reluctant to talk or to, she didn't seem to want to, to be alive. She didn't, she just was still in another world, it seemed. And so after several days, I remember as she finally began to eat and uh, sit up, and then I asked her, Mother, what happened? What happened that night? Can you tell me? Do you want to talk about it? And she said, Yes, I do want to talk about it to you, but don't ask me to get up in church. I get my gift of gab more from my father than I do my mother. And she was 
she didn't want to have to, 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 to but she said, um, uh, it, it's true. She said, that Lord, uh, that morning, the Lord s spoke to me very clearly that uh, today, Grace, I'm going to take you to be with me. And uh, I said, well, didn't you feel bad about leaving me? <laughs> <laughs> Tip typical 16-year-old remark, you know. And my and daddy, you know, um, and um, she said, "Well, of course I I did, but I was so joyful, and it, I, I was I was filled with such peace to think that I was going to see the Lord, that it was greater than the reluctance I would have to leave you." And she said, "I knew you'd be all right," and um, so. Uh, then she told me how she talked to Pastor Allen. And then um, uh, she said, I was really, I knew that it was the Lord when you came into the bedroom, that the Lord wanted you to be here. And uh, she said, as we were praying, I looked up and I saw the Lord enter the room. And of course, my question was, what did he look like? <laughs> you know. <laughs> And she said, well, it was like, kind of like the Bible story pictures that you see in, in Bible story books. He, she said, um, but his face, she said, was like light, like, it, like the sun. You could hardly look at it. It was so bright. And she said, he came over to me and he um, spoke to me and he said, Grace, I've come to take you home. And... Uh, then she said, he touched my head. And when he touched my head, I felt my soul, I felt myself come out of my body. And I looked back briefly, and I could see my body lying on the bed or, or uh, uh, kneeling by the bed. And she said, but I was standing, and I was like a child standing by Jesus. And she said, there was suddenly everything earthly was gone uh, almost, almost immediately. And this, except for that brief glance of my body. And then she said, there was a stream of light that went from my feet. Um, and and um, I said, and she said it was upward. I had a sense of direction. And I said, well, how far up, you know? <laughs> and she said, well, there wasn't a sense of distance, but just direction that was upward. And it was such a, a fine thread it wasn't a big, wide path. It was just like a thread of light. And she said, Jesus and I moved on that light. And, um, and she said, we came into a place that was like a park. She said, it's very hard to describe because she said all of the, all of the uh, surroundings were like different materials, <laughs> different substances. But she said, it was like a park and like green lawns, but it wasn't gr grass. <laughs> and she said in the air, it, the air atmosphere was color. It was like pastel colors moving all around me. And I was breathing them in. And as I breathed them in, they became music. And I was breathing this music. And she said it was, I was just filled with the color and music and the sense of my surroundings. I said, well, were you all alone? She said, oh, no. She said, there were people everywhere. I said, well, were they sleeping? She said, no, they were awake <laughs> uh, and, and restful and peaceful. But she said they were in different groups and, and, uh, and it was, you know, they were aware. I was aware of them and they were aware of me. And, uh, and she said, I knew everybody. I knew them by name. And then she began to name Bible characters. Now, my mother was not a Bible student and hadn't read the Bible hardly at all. I mean, we were only been saved about a month, you know. And, um, or maybe, you know, this was in May. Yeah, so it was in a month. And uh, so she said, um, the, the people... I just knew everybody, and so I said, well, wait a minute. So I went and got the Bible, and we had, in the back of the Bible were proper names. <laughs> so 
as she called out these different names of people that she remembered seeing. I looked them up and they were in the Bible and they were, when I looked up the references, they were like they were righteous before the Lord or, and, and so on. Old Testament characters, New Testament. And then she said, and I saw, I, I saw my mother and that's really surprised me because my grandmother had died when my mother was just three days old. And there had been a flu epidemic that had come through the mountains. And my mother, grandmother, and grandfather had both died in that flu epidemic. So my mother never remembered her parents. And she never saw a photograph of her mother. So uh, there were, she was the 13th child. So I often wonder if she died of the flu or if she died of childbirth, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, she she um, uh, was just a, that that whole family when the parents both died were just scattered uh, all over the mountains there to, to different families, and many uh, some of her brothers and sisters she had she didn't see for years until they finally found each other, you know. So. She was just kind of knocked from pillar to post. And she said, oh, yeah, I know it was my mother. I said, how could you know? Well, she said, he looked just, she looked just like Leonard. Well, uh, we have Indian, American Indian blood in us. And, and one of my cousins looks very Indian. He has jet black hair and um, uh, uh, dark, uh, like almost blue, black eyes, you know, uh, brown black eyes and kind of a, a, a darker complexion, high cheekbones. And, uh, and she said, she looked like Leonard. Well, of course, in chronologically, it would be Leonard looking like her, you know, but um, she said, um, uh, uh, she had long, dark hair right over her shoulders. She looked like she was about 20 years old and she had those wonderful high cheekbones and black eyes. And um, I, I knew her, and she knew me. And uh, I said, well, what about your father? He had fiery red hair. <laughs> so I think she would have remembered him, I think. But uh, I, I learned later uh, through other relatives. And she said, oh. She said, you know, I don't remember seeing him. And I didn't even miss him. And you know, I often wondered how heaven could be heaven if you don't, you know, if 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 your husband or your father isn't there, you know. Uh, but apparently, the Lord takes care of that memory, you know. She said, "I, I never even thought about it." And um, uh, and then she said, while she was. Uh, feeling this great joy and peace and this music, she says, breathing this music. <laughs> uh, you, you that are who are musicians would probably appreciate that. You know that your atmosphere, your air, would be music. <laughs> and um, I said, what kind of music? And she said, oh, she, and my mother wasn't a great, um, um, you know, she wasn't a musician, and she. Uh, wasn't well educated. She didn't have a musical education, but she did love classical music. And she said, it was just like the most wonderful symphony you could have ever heard, you know, but different. Every, and she kept telling me that, but different. <laughs> and I remembered later on when I was reading the book of Revelation that uh, so often John the Revelator will say it was as glass or as gold, you know, he was trying to, he had the same problem. <laughs> it was like a topaz or whatever it might be. So um, uh, she says, right in the midst of all that joy, she heard my voice. Mm -hmm. And she heard me saying, Jesus, bring my mother back to me. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, the Lord looked at me and, and he smiled and he said, Grace, I have to take you back. And uh, I said, well, how did that make you feel? And she said, I was in so, so in harmony with God's will that it didn't make any difference. 
whatever, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and um, it wasn't, she didn't feel inclined to beg him to stay or anything. And it was, w w wouldn't that be wonderful to be that so, so submitted and, in, and completely surrendered to the will of the Lord that even if he wanted to take you out of heaven, <laughs> you wouldn't quarrel with him. And um, uh, so she said, suddenly that, that stream of light appeared again. It, it, it had disappeared when they stepped into that heavenly atmosphere environment. But she said, that stream of light appeared and on, uh, all around us as we moved on to it was outer darkness, this darkness. And when we moved, she said, I felt very safe. And the Lord had my hand. And again, she said, I felt this childlike. I was so, such, a, such a child. And uh, that encounter that my mother had, which she always remembered, of salvation, she was only eight years old. And uh, I don't want to make a doctrine out of this or anything, but it was just like she felt like she was at the same age. I was so light. My mother was a big, heavy woman. She said, I was weightless. She said, <laughs> That really impressed her. She said, I was so light <laughs> and so young, you know, and alive, you know. So um, she said, then when uh, at a certain point, she said, then I, um, the Lord let go of me. And when he let go of my hand, she said, I felt myself come uh, enter, re-enter my body. And my senses seemed to come like they were slotted in. She said, I heard sooner than I could see or speak, but I felt my senses return. Isn't that an unusual thing? Um, and um, and uh, she said that, that my last ability was to speak. Uh, she said, I looked at you, and then I could speak, and I asked you that question, you know. Talk to us about cultural definitions of holiness. I, I was struck in your book about when you when you met. The she Supreme really does Italian. tumble these out, doesn't she? <laughs> They're, each one of them would make a book, you yes, know. <laughs> yes. That's why we want her for a year. <laughs> um, but you walk in. Cul there, say that again. Cultural. Cultural views of holiness. Cultural views of holiness. You walk in, they're smoking pipes and drinking cocktails. Yeah. And some lady said the Holy Spirit was like gin and your orange juice. Yeah. And you were, that was culturally different than Shocking. holiness. Shocking. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> in, in this generation, and I, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak for this generation, but but every generation seems to have different ideas of what was yeah. holiness. Now, I was raised, I couldn't wear pants. You know, if you want to be holy, you don't wear pants. You don't wear... You, you know, mean trousers. Rings, trousers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um. yeah, I guess they're, if they're ladies, they're trousers. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it more biblical, right? We could change yeah. the name. Yeah. You can watch TV, you can go to movies. Yeah. There seems to be cultural aspects to holiness, and, and it keeps the generations apart sometimes mm -hmm. because we say, oh, those... Those piercings or those earrings mm -hmm. or those tattoos mm -hmm. or those whatever. What has God taught you? Uh, take us back to when you walk in, and what did God do mm -hmm. in you? I know God blessed the Episcopalians, but what did God <laughs> do in you? Well, he uh, revolutionized my whole mm -hmm. life, really. Uh, up to that time, I had been very protected within a Pentecostal environment, and I knew the rules, mm -hmm. you know. And the rules were... You don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with boys that do, you know. So <laughs> there was a particular group in Van Nuys that kept asking me if I would come out and speak for their Bible study group. And I had kept re uh, declining. And very, um, very I'm ashamed to own it, but with, with, with real almost disdain. I said to them um, in my replies, um, I, I have four services a week at Angel's Temple and three are broadcast. You have plenty of opportunity to come and hear me, you know. It was more or less that. And I don't have the time to go out to the valley and, and so forth. And uh, so uh, 
they were persistent. You would have thought that such an insult would have turned them away. But instead, <laughs> they, they uh, kept sending the invitation. And I got it. My secretary said, here's another one from that group, <laughs> you know. And I started to say, well, just send the usual reply or let's forget it or something. And the Spirit of God, one thing Foursquare did teach me, and that was don't disobey the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, uh, he said, uh, I want you to accept this invitation. And I knew I had to phone them or I would never get around to it. So I phoned them and I said, uh, I think I can come on this date. Oh, goody, <laughs> which was sort of a trivial word, I thought. <laughs> uh, and uh, so said, uh, I, uh, we, we knew you were going to come. And I had this kind of uneasy feeling that these people were ahead of me. You know? <laughs> and I didn't like that. I, I was ahead of them, you know. And so um, they said, would you wear your robes? This is, you wanted me to tell this. Yeah, OK. My, my robes, well, in Foursquare in those days, um, for good or for worse, uh, I don't know, for better or for worse, we don't do it anymore, but the women ministers in Foursquare used to always wear a uniform, and it was a white dress with a navy blue cape and a white lining, the, the, the real uniform. <laughs> there, were, there were abbreviations of it at times. But uh, a, a white dress with a blue cape and a white lining and a shield on the front with a, unif with a cross on it. It was very... It was very elegant, and it covered a multitude of sins, you know. <laughs> and um, so, uh, and they said, you know, would you wear your robes? Because the Episcopalians would really appreciate that. And I said, oh, we don't wear our robes. Uh, we call it a uniform. Uh, we don't wear it like the Salvation Army everywhere. We only wear it, I only wear it in my own pulpit, at my own pulpit. And they said, oh, but you look so nice. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I wish you would. And so um, the flattery got somewhere. You know? <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, all right then. And kind of against my better judgment, you know, I uh, agreed. And so I came, you know, went out there looking like uh, Zorro sisters. <laughs> Superman's sister or somebody. <laughs> and uh, and I, I walked in to this really nice church hall. It was huge. And I, it, when I walked in, there was this uh, uh, cocktail party going on. They were drinking cocktails, and, and the priest was puffing on a pipe, and most of the people were smoking, you know. And I blinked, and I said to the lady that escorted me in, Where, where's the group I'm supposed to teach? And they, she said, oh, we're the group, and we can't hardly wait to hear you. And I thought, oh, Lord. And I asked her for the, weather, for the restroom, so I went to the lady's room, and I said, Lord, what have you got me into? Because I knew he had told me to come, you know. And he said, Jean, you put away your notes and just answer their questions and don't uh, use the message that you have prepared. And they'd ask me to speak on the sequence or something like that, the spirit-filled life. And so I had made it in seven steps. <laughs> and uh, my first one was negative, very negative. It was um, God never fills an unclean vessel. <laughs> and, and all those people out there were dirty pots as far you know, as I was concerned. So I, I thought, well, gladly, Lord, I'll put my notes away because I don't think this message is going to fit this crowd, you know. So uh, it was sort of like a catechism. You know, I, I just came out and I said, I just sense instead of using my message, prepared message, I should just answer your questions today if I can, you know. And, uh, and I, I, as I kind of blinked through the holy smoke, you know, <laughs> I saw they, they actually had their Bibles as well, you know. And, uh, and, and again, they used that word, oh, goody. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, goody, we, we hoped that you would do that. It was like they already knew, you know. And again, I, I had this unsettled feeling of these people are ahead of me, <laughs> you know. And uh, it, it bothered me that I was bothered by it, you know. I, I was just being unmasked by the Lord, and I didn't like it, you know. And I, the, so there I stood like, outside, uh, like a high priestess of Pentecost, you know, <laughs> my <laughs> robes in this unholy crowd. <laughs> and um, the first question was, um, how can we know, how can we know the difference between when we just feel like we want to say something or when we really have a gift of prophecy. And I never expected a question like that from that crowd, you know. I thought, wow, I, I wish some of my four square people would ask that question, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then they, uh, I answered that and uh, uh, then uh, they asked me, um, the second one I remember was, um, what did St. Paul mean when he said that there should be three messages in tongues and that by course in interpretation? And I, oh, this has to come out of some kind of an experience. And I was actually beginning to believe that these people were filled with the Spirit, you know. And I mean, they look so different than my usual congregation. I did, there was one lady particularly, very Miss Beverly Hills, you know, lots of heavy gold jewelry and heavy makeup and bleached hair and very long red fingernails and heavy makeup, you know. I mean, and they were, they didn't fit the, the expectations I had. And so, not that we were that strict. I mean, Sister McPherson was kind of noted for being rather a liberal Pentecostal, if you could put it that way, in that she dressed very nicely and, and wore makeup and kept her hair well-groomed and so forth. But um, in a day when it was spiritual to be... be ugly. Ugly, yeah, <laughs> right. Shoddy, you know. And... Uh, so it, it, it wasn't that I was that narrow-minded, but I just felt like these, these people had, didn't have the least idea of what the re requirements were for a spirit-filled life. And I think maybe that's why I'm a little reluctant when people ask me, well, what can I do to have a ministry or what preparation should I have? I'm almost swinging over the other way now in that I have seen this amazing grace of God coming to your point on culture, um, I realized that, that God doesn't always work one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But he um, works, and, and, and I realized how very prescribed we were in Pentecost. We had this prescription almost. You do this and God will do that, you know. And you do it in this order. <laughs> And God often works um, seven, one, four, three, <laughs> five, six, you know. But he always gets it all in. Because what I heard them say was uh, like, um, you know, that remark of uh, uh, Miss, Miss Beverly Hills did that. She, she said that. Uh, oh, she said, having the Holy Ghost is such makes you feel so tingly inside. It's like gin and your orange juice. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, oh, I'm glad Dr. McPherson isn't here, you know. But um, uh, I, on the way home, I, was, I said, Lord, did you hear that? You know? <laughs> and and uh, then I began to hum a little chorus that we were singing in our church at that time. And in our Four Square Church, we were singing, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling day and night. They're singing and laughing. Since Jesus, I can't hit those notes, made all things right. Folks don't understand it, nor can I keep it quiet. 
It's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. I go, well, that's gin in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I knew that the Lord had been teaching them and that he was doing it in his timing, his way, and that I wasn't to interfere. And so it broke my heart before the Lord. I saw that, um, that my self-righteousness and my narrow-mindedness and my Pentecostal prejudice was a, a stench in the nostrils of God. It bothered him far more than their cigarettes and drinking. And so I, uh, I repented at home, and then I repented before my congregation. <laughs> And I repented before this group out there and I asked them their forgiveness and admitted to them that I'd been very self-righteous. Mm -hmm. This follows up real quick. We went over to Germany mm -hmm. and we went this time into a very, very uh, a controlled Pentecostal church pastored by an ancient woman. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, she had her hair all piled up gloriously on top of her head, you know. <laughs> And I noticed that most of the women in the church had these beautiful hairdos, you know. And so um, I was remembered that at that time I wasn't wearing the four square uniform, but I was wearing a special white dress I had made for my ministry uh, in Europe. And I wore that with, uh, I remember, toeless and heelless shoes. And I had short hair and I had jewelry and some makeup. And she looked at me before I came uh, we went into the church and she said, are you going to preach in that, you know? And I said, yes, yes, I, I plan to. And she said, well, the, I think the neck is far too low. And I said, well, I'm, I suppose I could put a little scarf or something around it, you know? And she said, you must remove your makeup. And would you please take off your jewelry? Well, really, the only jewelry was my wedding ring and so on, you know? And I, then I began to get the, I, I began to understand what was going on there, you know. And, uh, and she said, I don't know what to do about your hair. But she said, I have a piece that you could use. <laughs> <laughs> and I discovered that she hardly had any hair at all. <laughs> and that it was all fake, you know, up here. But it was holy. But it was holy it was fake, holy. yeah, right. So uh, I thought, well, I'm not pastoring this church. I'm just here as a guest, so I'll go along with the old lady. And uh, so I did. And, and uh, I, no makeup, LaDonna, you know, and, and LaDonna was wearing boots. It was the kind of time when it was popular to have these high knee boots like, you know, and, um, and she had a ponytail and, and all. And of course, she tried to redress LaDonna, and I put a line there. I said, no, I said, my daughter's not on the platform and she pleases me and I'm sure she pleases God, so you leave her alone. <laughs> so we worked that out. But um, the, uh, she, she did do a couple of things that really hurt LaDonna quite badly, but I, I don't want to go into that. However, uh, the, the, there were many young people came to the Lord in that first week. And so they, she asked me if I would stay a second week. And I said, all right, uh, do you really want me for the second week? She said, yes, I know I got some leverage here, you know. <laughs> and so I said, well, last week I stayed on your terms. This week I'd like to stay on my terms. And I'm going to take off the piece and I'm going to wear a little makeup and put my wedding ring back on and be myself, because I said, I'm going to meet these people some place sometime, and if they see me other than I really am, they're going to think I'm the biggest hypocrite on the face of the earth. And um, she wanted me so much, she agreed. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, uh, next, next service I stood up, they kind of, oh, you know. And then I said, now, uh, sister so-and-so, I won't use her name, I said, she is following the convictions of her own heart, and I know she wants to please the Lord just as much as I do. But this is the way I am, and that the Lord loves me, 
And I said, I just wanted you to know that so that if you meet me somewhere, you won't think that I was trying to fool you, you know. And I said, so if you can just forget looking at the outside and listen to the same message, uh, we'll see what God will do this week with the makeup. <laughs> and they were all kind of, you know, the kids were all kind of nudging one another, you know. And uh, the Lord blessed even more the second week. So uh, that, that's kind of a little practical lesson on cultures. Uh, but the funny thing about it was, the, this is the twist in the tale, is that we stayed in the parsonage there, and these were two women that pastored this church. One was a preacher, and the other one was sort of prayer partner. And they were lovely, very, uh, very fun-loving. Uh, you wouldn't get that idea of what I said, but they were full of good humor and so on. And... Uh, the first meal that they served us in their home, guess what they brought out? Steins of black beer. And they made it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> With all this holiness, you know. And so LaDonna looks at me and I look there, and neither one of us care much for beer. We did like the wine, though. And uh, <laughs> so she said, uh, she, we got in the bedroom and I said, now, what do you think of that? And I said, well, that just shows you, honey, that, can, that, that cultural, cultures change. And they can change even not only within a na between nations, but they can change within periods of our lifetime where our, our, what we like and what we feel we can do and what we can't do changes. And I said, but there's one thing about convictions. When the Holy Spirit convicts you about something and you make a vow to the Lord that you won't do that anymore be, for Jesus, that you, that's something between you and Jesus. It's a covenant. It's a love thing. That never changes. And it's never a burden. It's never an embarrassment. And you don't embarrass others with it. It's something that's really between you and the Lord. I, I, it seems like he keeps showing me this church by the century, <laughs> not just for a decade, but for the whole 21st century. And what I see is the church breaking out of its buildings, its institutions, and the, the, the church in the marketplace, the church penetrating, um, penetrating the secular field, the secular world, with impact, uh, being called into communications, called into the arts, called into uh, politics, um, just as clearly as people have been called in the past as missionaries to China or Africa or, or uh, into Christian education or into uh, medical missions. And the bringing such, not only such dedication and compassion and different life values, but also bringing brilliance through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, miraculous understanding and revelation, discovery of new things, new sciences, new music, new, new uh, language, you might say. Um, uh, it's just so big. <sighs> that um, I just think that by the end of the 21st century, if Jesus tarries, the church will be ex by exterior and interior far different than we see it today. <laughs>